so good to be together on a Wednesday night, one of my favorite nights. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Noah. I serve as one of the pastors here on our staff. But we love that we're a church that prays together. Uh, so what we're going to do right now, uh, if you have prayer requests, if you're watching online and there are things that you need prayer over, what I want you to do is pull out your phone, send the word uh, prayer to the phone number 77247. You could give us your prayer requests there because we would love to pray for you during the service. So go ahead and do that now. We're a church that prays, then plans. But do me a favor, Crossroads. Let's come together right now. Let's worship God through song. If you feel confident and comfortable, I would love for you to make your way to the front and let's give Jesus the praise that he deserves. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's worship him, church.
worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I love Wednesday night, guys. I love this church. In fact, this last Sunday, we were able to celebrate seven people getting baptized. It was remarkable, but two of them, two of them were super special. I got to be a part of watching Martha and Miko get baptized. And uh, they're, they're a little bit older, but their genuineness was like incredible. It was so genuine. I, I felt like in that moment, I touched the heart of God. And they're like on cloud nine. And uh, they looked at me and they said these words. They said, this place is remarkable. I guarantee you guys are always all over this campus connecting with God. And I looked at her, I'm like, man, I live and breathe this place. I think I, after a while, how awesome the campus is, it, it kind of loses its effect. I was out there today, I'm like, this campus is remarkable. This is incredible. And I think that sometimes, sometimes what becomes so familiar loses its impact. And I think that at times, right now, we're gonna, we're gonna participate in communion, but, but I think that at times, we can lose the meaning of something that we do so often. And I don't know about you, I don't, I don't wanna show up to church just to get through another song, just to get through another message. No, I wanna show up because I'm expectant that we have a God who sees us and hears us and wants to meet us where we're at. And when we partake in communion, we are reminded that we serve a God who is present, not absent. And in fact, when Jesus first instituted communion, he looked at his, at his disciples and he said, I've earnestly desired to share this moment with you. And there was an awe factor about it. And the early church got together and they celebrated the relationship that, that they had with Jesus. In fact, the apostle Paul, he writes these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says this, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And right now, we're going to do that in remembrance of him. If you uh, walk through the doors, you should have gotten some communion. If you're a believer in here, we're going to partake. And for some reason, you haven't given your life to Jesus, you could sit back. But right now, we're just going to remember uh, the relationship that we have with Jesus, that we have a God who is present. The next verse says this. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So let us remember that we have a God who is present. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for the sacrifice that you made to make us right with you, to give us freedom, and to forgive us, God. So today we're reminded that we serve a God who is present. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's praise God. In a moment, we're gonna go into a time of greeting, but if this is your normal service to give, you can give by uh, giving your tithes and your offerings in the uh, buckets that are all around the room or the, uh, the you'll, you'll see some um, boxes all around the building and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to say it in English because we always say it in Spanish, but uh, they're all around the building. You could give that way or you could give electronically by sending uh, the word give to the number 77247. Also, just so you know, our new fiscal year starts in July, and if you guys want to see it, it'll be available in the lobby, or you can email info at crossroadschurch.com, and it could be emailed to you that way. But right now, as we go into a time of greeting, today's topic is this, it's the church. So I want you guys to ask your neighbor, what do you think the church means? Go ahead and do that right now. church online is what is your favorite part of church and for you specifically what is your favorite part about church online Casey you've been a church been a part of church for a while what's your favorite part about it yeah I think um, 
it's the people for sure. Yeah. It's the community. And I've been here for so long. I mean, since I was eight years old, yeah. which is a very long time. <laughs> uh, now let's just say that without giving my age. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when we go through tough times, especially in the last two years or so, something that's just made it so much easier is yeah. our church family. Just yeah. having strong, strong relationships and the kind of relationships that point you out of fear and into yeah. faith and just partner with you in every aspect of life. Yeah, what it's really you? cool. I, no, I think friendships for sure. And I, I remember back when I was just first starting to come to Crossroads specifically, um, it was a lot to take in. Yeah. We're a big church. Yeah. I come from a really small church and yeah. coming to a bigger church, it was great. There was a lot of just people here. Yeah. Um, and I got plugged into a life group uh, back in the day. And I remember going through a really hard season yeah. um, and we have this coffee shop over here in uh, Corona, California called Canvas now. I was going to say, are you um, going to plug our coffee shop or a different coffee our shop? Our is no longer here. Yeah. Um, but I remember just getting a phone call from my stepdad saying, hey, your mom may not make it. Um, in that moment, we dropped all conversation and just went right into a time of prayer um, for quite some time. So I think just having relationships to lean on, cry on, laugh with, yeah. um, and just having people by your side is so, so important super so, special um yeah. well we get to hear more about the church tonight we'd love yeah. to hear in the chat from you guys what really sticks out to you about the church what means the most to you about church um we're gonna get to hear some great yeah. theology about super the church cool. and how we should be partnering with the church yeah. um as believers uh, but we got a couple things for you guys to do you can text notes to get notes tonight to 77247 or set up coffee chats by texting that to 77247 as well cool. but right now let's get ready to hear from pastor patty Well, good evening, everybody. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. I heard you worship from back there. That was so uh, such a blessing for me to hear you guys singing and cheering and clapping for the Lord. My name is Patty. I am the elementary pastor here at Crossroads. Pastor Chuck is in Israel with a team from the church. I can't help but think... What a cool trip that would be to go with Pastor Chuck to Israel. He's so knowledgeable about the area and he loves it so much. I can't imagine the time that they are having there. But it is an honor and a joy for me to be with you tonight. And as I was preparing for tonight, I was reminded of a time when I was about 18 or 19 and I worked at a place called Black Angus. Does anybody know that? Okay, good. There's a few. It's kind of not really around so much anymore, but best Cheesy garlic bread and baked potato soup, hands down that you will ever find. I cannot find a better cheesy garlic bread even now. Like, it is so good. And one day when I was working there, um, there was a group of bussers and servers that were my age that were kind of off to the side, and I could overhear their conversation, and they were talking about church, a church that they liked. And... Growing up, I had an experience with church. I mean, before my family, my parents got divorced, I would go to a particular church, kind of here and there, Christmas and Easter type of thing. And then when my parents divorced, I would only go like every other weekend with one parent and it was boring, I never connected. And so when I was able to kind of make that choice, I stopped going altogether. So hearing a group of people that I worked with that were my age talk about church like they liked it, it kind of piqued my curiosity. So it stayed in my mind, and one random Sunday, I woke up, and I was like, I'm going to go to that church. Now, this was like years ago. So this was before cell phones and texting, and I still don't even know how I figured out how to get there. I probably map quested it or something. You guys remember printing legitimate maps? And so I hopped in my car and I drove and it felt like forever. Clearly this was before gas was like $687 a gallon. Um, and I ended up in this place called Yorba Linda. And it like felt like a fairyland to me because it looked so different from where I grew up. And I kept driving and I navigated some weird parking and I ended up in front of this building that just, it felt massive. And there was just this sea of people coming in and out, none of which I knew. But the music from inside, it like drew me in. And so I decided, well, I'm here, I might as well keep going. So I start to walk towards the door and all of a sudden I hear, Patty, hi. 
And I look up and at the door, like handing some people papers at whatever that paper was as they were walking in was my friend's dad. Someone that I had known when I was like little. And he recognized me. And he ended up taking me and helping me find my seat. And even though I didn't see him very often over the next few years, I actually credit that moment with the beginning of my journey to finding Jesus and to finding my place in the church. Now, we are in the series called You Believe That? And it is based off of an interview that all of us have to take in order to work here called the theology interview. In that interview are questions about who is Jesus, what is the Bible, who is the Holy Spirit. And the goal of the series is to equip you as believers with the ability to answer any questions that anyone might ask you about what you believe, like you believe that. And so today we are coming to the question of the church. What is the church? What is its purpose? And how do we become the church? Now, most of the time, I get to be over in kids ministry on Wednesdays and Sundays. And on Wednesdays in particular, I have the honor of being able to speak to your fourth and fifth graders. Now, I like to make it an interactive time. A lot of times I'll throw out a question. I want the kids to shout and answer back. So we're actually gonna do that here right now, okay? So when Pastor Noah sent you to greeting, he had you discuss a question. What is the church? And online, if you wanna participate in this too, you can just type in the chat, what is the church? So I wanna hear some of your answers, like maybe something you said or something you heard. So go ahead and shout it out. What is the church? Family, body of Christ, community. I love it. So good. These are all good answers. Now, in the book of Acts that we find in the New Testament, it's largely known in religious studies to be the place where we discover the birth of the organized church. And I'm kind of a word geek, and I like to find the true meanings of words because I really want to look smart in front of those fourth and fifth graders. I like to figure it out. And so I thought I really wanted to nail down what the meaning of the word church is. Now, the New Testament the books of the Bible where we read about Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and then the church from there forward is written in what language? Greek, yes. Pastor Chuck has said that before. You guys are totally paying attention. It is written in Greek. And there is a Greek word that we see being used quite a number of times in the New Testament. Let's check it out in the book of Acts. Acts eleven twenty six 26 says... This is in regards to Paul and Barnabas. That's who the both of them are. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. And then again, we see a word in the book of Acts, Acts 14. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together, reported everything that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. Now that word church that we see there also is gatherings and it is the Greek word ecclesia. Now, Strong's definition of ecclesia is a calling out, a popular meaning, especially in religious congregation. And Thayer's Greek lexicon definition of ecclesia is a gathering of citizens who are called out for a specific purpose. So we see that the word ecclesia means a gathering of people who have been called out for a specific purpose. Now, the actual word ecclesia has no religious connection to it at all. It largely means just that, a group of people who have been called out to gather for a specific purpose. But Jesus also uses the word ecclesia when he was talking to Peter in the book of Matthew, and we see this. Now, I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. All in all, the word ecclesia is used 116 times, both by Jesus and the writers of the New Testament. This word that means a group of people who have been called out to gather for a specific purpose. But what purpose? 
And how does knowing what ecclesia even means, like how does that apply to us? And then where do we get the word church from ecclesia? Here's the underlying context of the word ecclesia as it is used in scripture. It means a group of people who have been called out to gather by God to God. And the English word that we use, church, comes from another Greek word, kyriakos, which means belonging to the Lord. And Paul uses this word connected with ecclesia in an address to the leaders of the church in the book of Acts when he says this to them. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. So here we see a very, very specific meaning of the word ecclesia. It means his church. Right there. I'm not very good at under underlining. <laughs> Purchased by his own blood. So essentially, church equals a group of people or an assembly of people who have been called out by God, who belong to God because of what he did on the cross. Or as I like to say it, here's the church, here's the steeple, open up the doors and see all the people. You guys remember that, right? Now, oftentimes we like to think of church as a specific place, a specific building, a place that has a specific name. And we like to go to these places and gather them. We say things like, I'm gonna go to church today, right? Or we're gonna have church today. And we can feel a sense of ownership to those places. We might say something like, I go to this church, or he goes to that church, or this church is known for this, or I love my church. And all of those things are good things. But church is so much more than a building or a place. It is like that rhyme, the people. Now, I'm gonna make you all uncomfortable, especially you introverts today. Uh, go ahead and turn to your left, if you have someone on your left, and just look at them. You don't have to make it creepy. You know, we'll, we'll do it pretty quick. Like I said, some of you are nervous. All right, now you're gonna turn to the right and you're gonna look at the person on your right if there's someone at your right. Some of y'all may thank me later because you might've just met your future spouse, okay? You can come and thank me later. But church is the people. Whether you know the people you looked at or not, that person, you included, was called here tonight by God for a purpose, right? Whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, you are here because God called you out to be here. And in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, I'm going to erase that, Jesus says in the book of Matthew, where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Now, Pastor Ricky Jenkins, he's the senior pastor at Southwest Church in Indian Wells, Palm Springs. He actually says this about church. It's the people of God on mission from God for the glory of God. And wherever that happens, that's church. So I thought I would share like how that looks like uh, in my life most recently. A uh, couple Fridays ago, I had an opportunity to um, have some time to myself. That's super rare. I'm a full-time working mom. I rarely get time to myself. So I grabbed my journal and I headed over to the crossings. I like to sit by that water fountain that's in the middle. I love the sound of, of running water. Of course, I had you know my Starbucks shaken espresso. That doesn't hurt anything. So I'm sitting there and I'm journaling and I'm like pouring my heart out to the Lord and kind of out of the corner of my eye, I just, I see this woman walk by and I like take notice of her. And you know how like you can just get a sense sometimes about people? I just felt like in my spirit, like, um, like she had been sick and the word that came to my mind was cancer, but I didn't know her. So I was like, okay. Um, and she goes and she sits on the same row of red seats, but like all the way at the very end. So I go back to my journaling and I was there for a long time, you guys. I was there for like 30 minutes, like journaling and writing and pouring out my heart. But I kept looking at her because I was noticing that she wasn't doing anything. She was just sitting. She wasn't drinking a coffee. She wasn't reading. She wasn't on her phone. She was just sitting. And as I was journaling, I just got this sense like the Lord wanted me to pray for her. 
So I was like, okay, I can do that, all right. So I just prayed for her. I prayed that God would bless her and that God would help her to feel seen. And then I felt like God said, uh, I want you to be the answer to that prayer for her. And I was like, <laughs> right. And then it got worse because then I felt in my spirit like God wanted me to rip out a piece of my journal and give it to her. Because along with writing in my journal, I also draw scripture. I love to draw scripture. It helps me feel connected to the word. I post it on the internet. You guys, here's the deal. I am not Pastor Chuck, okay? I do not get a word from the Lord telling me to go buy eggs and stand on a street corner and give it to a lady in purple. Like that kind of stuff does not happen to me. So the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, this is not, this can't be, God. I'm like arguing with God, right? So I'm like, okay, fine. All right, fine. If this is God, so cool, right? And if it's not God, well, then the worst that happens is that I look stupid for Jesus. And the best that happens is that I give her scripture and it's in her hands, right? So I'm like, okay, God, okay, fine, I'll do this. All the while I'm still bargaining because I'm like, okay, God, well, if it's really you, then she'll still be sitting there while I'm slowly looking through my verses to find the right one. And of course I land on one and she's still there. And the one I land on was actually a mix of verses. It said things like, you are more than a conqueror. And if God is for you, who can be against you? I can do all things in Christ. So I'm like, okay, God, if this is you, when I rip it out, it's gonna rip out nice and clean and it's not gonna tear. And of course it does that. So I'm like, all right, Jesus, okay, I'm gonna do this. And so I like gather my stuff and I walk up to her and I just introduced myself to her. And then I told her, I said, you know, I don't know what you believe or if you believe in God, but I was just sitting over there journaling and I just really felt in my heart like God might want you to have this. And I gave it to her. And then it was the moment of truth. And there was like silence. But she was reading it and then she looked at me and she said, I'm gonna cry. And she shared with me that she had gone through cancer, that she had just come out of it, that it was a really rough couple of years for her, that she's going through a lot of things, but that she is a believer, and that all the while she was going through these things, those specific verses were the ones that God had pointed out to her. And her friend had even just given her a journal that said, you are more than a conqueror on it. And that whole time, I have to tell you, I was so much more blessed because then we started sharing with each other. We started sharing Bible verses and scriptures. I ended up praying over here. And you know what? Being stupid for Jesus led me to have Ecclesia right there in the crossings by that fountain. It was so cool, guys. <laughs> so now we come to that question of why the church? Why a gathering of people who are called out by God to God? Well, number one, God desires to have a people belonging to him. We actually see this in the Old Testament. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy where it says, for you are a holy people who belong to the Lord our God. Now, this verse was actually originally spoken about the Israelites, a group of people that God had set apart for himself. However, for those of us who believe in Jesus, it also applies to us because of the blood of Jesus on the cross. So we see this in 1 Peter. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's, I'm gonna write, do this, very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Gotta erase that. Now, for those of you who maybe have felt like you don't have a place or you feel alone, this truth says that you have a place in God's family. And he does it through his church. Because you see, God didn't just create the church for himself, he also created it for our benefit. Genesis 2.18 says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. 
Now again, this scripture was about woman when God was creating Eve for Adam. It was specifically about that. But if you look at it, it says it is not good for the man to be alone. You see, God created us to do life with each other. He created us for community. So some of you who shouted community, yes, that is church. It is community. In fact, a lot of you are probably familiar with this verse. It's a little long. It says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And for all you guys in the room, that is the answer to that age old question you have always wondered, why do women go to bathrooms in groups? (laughs) But, (laughs) really though, uh, number two, God designed for us to be in community. Now, the early church in the book of Acts gives us a really great example of what this could look like. It's kind of a long scripture, so hang in there with me. All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them and, uh, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and their possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Okay, that was a lot. (laughs) But here we see the beginning of what we know as the church. And this section of scripture is actually commonly referred to as the Acts 2.42 church. Now these people that met together regularly, they actually probably had no commonality. These people who were called out by God and to God. They probably had no connection to each other unless they were family. It was filled with people from different ethnic backgrounds, different social backgrounds, different economic backgrounds. There were young, there were old, there was slave, there was free. There was all kinds of people. Now, in fact, there also was, as we read there, there were no factions, there were no denominations. They met in one place, with the idea that it would be open to anyone who wanted to come and hear the word of God being spoken. But they had one common purpose, and that was to know God more, to love Jesus more, and to love each other. Now, think about it for a minute. For those of you who have been a part of Crossroads for any length of time, even online, think about the people you have connected with because of this place. It's kind of like that. Would you know each other? Would you talk after church? Would you chat online in the chat with them had you not had this one commonality together here? And see, that is what the church is meant to be. It is meant to be a support system, not to do life alone. Now, personally, me and my family have experienced this support system in so many ways, both small and big. Uh, My daughter, Taya, she plays football. There's a picture of her. Isn't she rad? She's pretty rad. She plays football and her uh, coach, Connor, and his wife, Tracy, are a part of our community here at the church. I can't tell you how many times Connor has taken her home from practice or Tracy, they have fed her dinner and then brought her here back to church because I'm already here. Then my friend Kelly, whose son also plays on her team, who is also a part of my community here at the church, has done that as well. She has taken her home, fed her dinner, and brought her back to church. Now, uh, the Saturday night before Mother's Day, my dog got injured really badly and he had to go to uh, the emergency room, the emergency vet, and he had to get 20 stitches. So I was super bummed on Mother's Day and I came to work and I was here, but I was just kind of like sad in my spirit. And my friend Bianca, who is a part of my community here, brought me flowers 
and brought me a snack because she wanted to make sure that I felt loved and cared for. We've had meals brought to us. We've had groceries brought to us during sickness and times of surgery. And in fact, when my husband had to be admitted uh, in an emergency to the hospital back in September, I didn't even have to worry about my kids because Pastor Talia grabbed them from church where they already were, took them home, fed them dinner. They spent the night. She took them to school the next morning and even gave them money for lunch. And my friend Kim, who is a part of my community here, literally texts me multiple times during the week to ask me specifically how she can be praying for me. And she is a huge support to me. None of these things would have happened had it not been for my community here at the church. And this is what it looks like to be a people called out by God to God. In fact, this connection, this commonality, it's what they had in the Acts 2.42 church. So we're gonna break down that scripture a little bit more so we can see it. Acts 2.42 says, all of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now the word fellowship is another Greek word and it is koinonia. It means the unity of the spirit that comes from sacred beliefs or convictions. You see, when those of us who believe in Jesus, who have decided to follow him with our whole heart and lives, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit connects you and I to each other. And that is called fellowship. Fellowship looks like worshiping together. Fellowship looks like working together with a common goal in mind. Fellowship looks like God's will being done in our lives, in each other's lives, and in the church. It is partnership with each other. Now, these believers did other things too. They also shared in meals together. They prayed together. And if we can go to the next slide, I'll show you a couple other things they did. And then specifically, they sold their property and their possessions, and they shared with everyone who was in need. And then we saw that there was a sense of awe among them. The reason why there was a sense of awe among them is because God was moving among them. You see, miracles were happening. The apostles were doing miracles. Life change was occurring. And it was all because of their focus, all because they cared for each other. You see, they met together to care for each other, but also to grow and to encourage one another. Paul says, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by your faith. I can't tell you the number of times I've come here and have been encouraged by you and your faith. When you come to me and share with me how God has answered your prayers, when you come to me and share with me the struggles you've been going through, but how God met you or how your life has changed since you have given your life to the Lord, it's incredibly encouraging to me. You know, just recently, um, I actually was struggling a little bit with really feeling like God was hearing me um, and really feeling like he was answering my prayers. And yes, pastors can feel like that too. Um, but I was sharing that with my prayer partner, Kim, part of my community. And she was able to show me very specifically what I had been missing. In that conversation, she encouraged me because she showed me and pointed out just how God was meeting me and moving in my life and I had missed it because I was so focused on my problem. And another time, I was talking to a staff member here and she was sharing with me about how God was moving in her life and it spurred a memory in mine to remember a time very specifically when God met my need and answered my prayer and it was an encouragement. But this church also met together to do this. In Hebrews, we see this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is near. And this is the answer to the question that we have of how do we become the church? You see, as we have seen, the church was designed to be different than the world around us. We read in Romans that the church was meant to be an encouragement. 
Then we saw in the book of Acts that the church is meant to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. We saw that through the way they treated each other and the way they cared for each other. Then we just read in Hebrews that the church was to motivate each other to good works and to love. And then again in Acts 2.42, we saw that the church was a family. But here's the kicker. We all have a part to play. I've already given examples of how the church has been an encouragement, but what does it look like to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world? Well, looking back at Acts 2.42 through 47, we saw that they did things like sold their property, that they met each other's need. They all helped doing what they needed to do. The church is meant to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, and it is meant to provide help and care for other believers. But like, what does this tangibly look like? What does becoming the church look like? Well, at Crossroads, we do this in a lot of ways. Some of the bigger ways are, I could think of um, the food pantry. The food pantry meets once a week. Hundreds of families come to the food pantry where we give them basic necessities like bread and eggs and milk and toiletries and things like that. And then also you participate when we do things like boldly bless, where you give an extra dollar more and then we take that money and we use it to be a tangible need helper for someone in our community. But then also I started thinking about the fact that we have teams in Israel and we have a team going to Kenya, leaving on Friday, and it made me think of how they are the hands and feet of Jesus in Kenya and in Israel just around the world. Now, I was thinking about my friend Ernie. Ernie is going to Kenya on Friday. This is Ernie here. He's been there before. He's kind of one of those guys that is at church every time there's church. He serves any chance that he gets. He helps out in kids ministry and go ministry. And he was sharing with me about a time when he went to Kenya and they were going to do a VBS for like 2,000 kids. And one of the girls on the team, her name is Taylor, She came up to him and she was kind of, she was sad. She had tears in her eyes and she said, Ernie, I just don't know why God has me here. I feel like he hasn't used me yet. I feel like he's not using me. I don't know what my purpose is here. And Ernie encouraged her and he told her, you know what, just pray. Pray and ask God, like, how can you use me today? Like, use me today. So they go to the Mara and they're doing um, the VBS and they see this young fella, his name is Laposo. Now, Laposo has a special need. And in a part of his special need, he has multiple special needs, but one of them is that he's nonverbal. So they started noticing that even though he was a part of the school and the VBS, that the other kids were not including Laposo. Because as it turns out, they didn't understand his special need and they actually thought it was something they could catch. So they thought that by playing with him or touching him, that they would also become nonverbal. And so they weren't including him. So Taylor happened to work here with our special needs ministry at Crossroads, notices this, gathers the puppet team together that already pre-planned all the things they were going to do and the script they were going to do to do the puppets. And she said, we have to help this kid. So on the spot, they changed their script to include Laposo to make him the star of the show and to show all the kids that God thinks everybody is special and that God has a plan for everybody. Everyone. That moment changed Laposo's life. And they started noticing that other kids were starting to include Laposo after that time. But I know that some of you have also been on the receiving end of someone being the hands and feet. Maybe you've received a meal, maybe you have been prayed for. But I wanted to invite my friend Tawny up. Tawny is here today. She's actually gonna share about a time when she was on the receiving end of the church being the hands and feet. Hello, Tawny. Uh, Tawny has been serving in kids ministry uh, for about six years or so, but I've known Tawny for about seven. Um, I count her as a very close friend of mine, but largely it's because we've started our connection through serving together here at Kids Ministry, right? And what do I jokingly call you? 
I don't know, what do you jokingly call me? Oh, my daughter, oh, Taya. <laughs> yes, her, her daughter's uh, best adult friend. Yes, so da- my yeah. daughter, Taya, the one that plays, yeah, they're BFFs. Mm-hmm. They're together mm-hmm. like all the time. But see, even that is part of the church because we need each other, right? So Tawny pours into my kids and that's a huge blessing to me as a mom. But Tawny, you recently went through a struggle. It did, um, yeah. I would love for you to share. Yeah, so it's been about six months um, since my dad went to be with Jesus. And uh, he died at 70, so wasn't like super young, but also like wasn't really expecting it. Mm. And um, he passed uh, early Sunday morning. And I just kind of felt this nagging that I needed to go to church. But I was like, out of all the days not to serve, the day your dad dies, like that's the day you just don't go, right? That's the day you don't go serve. Like that's, that's ridiculous. But as the time went on, I just was like, oh, I should go, I should go, I should go. And I thought, oh, maybe it's, you know, just because, like, I made a commitment or maybe it was because I was used to going on, you know, Sundays. But, you know, maybe it was, looking back, it was definitely the Holy Spirit. And um, trying to make all these excuses, finally commit to going. And I, and I show up in the parking lot, like, 11.15. And I'm never late to church. <laughs> so this is, like, 11.15? Like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand out. I'm going to look stupid. Like, why, why am I even going? And I'm just like, oh, and I'm making my way up the cement. And I see one of our volunteers, Wendy, and she kind of, it's that kind of that moment um, when the prodigal son is walking up and the father comes and it just runs to me and just says one thing, can I give you a hug? Mm. And I had no idea how much I needed that. Mm-hmm. No idea. And I was like, okay, I could like breathe. It was like this exhale moment. I'm like, okay. We went inside uh, Fellowship Hall where, where I serve um, with the kids ministry and I, I saw Pastor Patty and I saw Pastor Lauren. Like, you're here. We weren't expecting you. And then one by one, each kid is like, I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited you're here. And then I kind of see out of the corner of my eye, Pastor Chuck is making a beeline for me. And I instantly think I'm in trouble because I don't know if it's the principal or something. I'm like, what do I do? And he walks over and he's like, I heard what happened and I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. And if there's anything I can do to help. And I was just like, how does he know? How do all these people know? I didn't say mm-hmm. anything. I, I basically called you or texted you to cancel serving. Yeah. yeah. And now all these people are coming up. And I just was like one after one, each volunteer, one after one. And then even, even I had volunteers that I work with um, at 9 a.m. sometimes, um, Vince and Elizabeth, they came up and they're like, we heard you on campus. So after service, they hunted me down just to say something. And I came to the campus with such this burden, right? Like sorrow and grief and fear and, you know, all these negative emotions. And each person was able to trade Mm -hmm. just a little piece of my sorrow Mm -hmm. for kindness, Mm -hmm. for being seen, for being acknowledged that this is difficult. Mm -hmm. And they probably have no idea how much it impacted me because what they took was so light for them. But you get 10 people, 15, 30 40 people that do that, and all of a sudden, you can breathe. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that was possible if I hadn't have been serving. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we have the huddles, um, and each of the huddles, you know, my dad was given, like, three years to live in in November, and then within 30 days, he was gone. And so we had, you know, four weeks or so that they were praying, and they were walking me through that. And so I didn't have to explain my situation. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to say anything. I didn't have words, and Mm -hmm. they just, they were there, and they could help carry my load. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when you were sharing that story with me, you told me that it was a gift. It it was. It was was so special and so unexpected, and I did not show up to get something. I actually showed up because I felt, probably felt a little bit like I had to, but (laughs) um, (laughs) I had commitments. But yeah, it was so special. I will, I will never, I will never forget that. Thank you for sharing, Tani. Um, Before Tani goes, I actually would love to be a church with her right now, and I'd love to pray over her. Um, And I'm going to include Ernie in this prayer, too, because he's going to leave for Kenya on Friday. So let's take a moment to just pray for our sister and brother. Lord, um, I thank you for Tawny and for her dedication to serve you. But I thank you specifically for meeting her um, in that moment. And God, um, as she continues to walk through uh, the grief of losing her father, I pray for more moments like that, moments that feel like she's connected and seen just like she said. And we do continue to lift up Ernie to you and also the Kenya team that is heading out and also, Lord, the team that's in Israel right now. Would you watch over them, protect them, and allow them to be your hands and feet across the world? We praise you here tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Tani. Guys. That's church. 
And as we read in in Hebrews 10, the, the day of Jesus' return is near. And the days that we live in right now are evil. That's what Ephesians says. I mean, you really only have to look at the news for five minutes to get that, right? Or even go on Facebook for that. Because you see, in these last days, the church is actually God's ultimate plan for redemption. The church that is filled with imperfect people is God's perfect plan for redemption. And believe me, I know I am one of those imperfect people. I have struggles. I have moments of fear or anxiety or stress or doubt. That is me. And I know that the church sometimes doesn't get it. Sometimes we can become polarized and we choose a side and we alienate a whole group of people. Sometimes the church as a whole, we have seen like church splits or uh, maybe moral failures or financial failures from pastors that are super public, that are really, really disheartening and hurt a lot of people in the process. Sometimes we have seen even the abuse of the church, which actually is tragic and horrible. However, when church is done right, like the way it is done in Acts 2.42, it can be beautiful. And because Jesus is so cool, Because this is his plan for redemption, the church has withstood and persevered for thousands of years. But like I said before, everyone has a role to play. You see, the book of Acts is filled with people who didn't leave the work of many to few. You see, they understood the assignment. They knew that they needed to use what they had in order to support and love and care for each other. Can you imagine, guys, what it would look like if we as the church looked like that? If we decided to not take a stand for what we are against, but take a stand for what we are for instead, the Acts 242 church did that. And by loving others and caring for those around them, God added to their numbers daily those that were being saved. And I imagine that if we did the same at the church here at Crossroads and around the world, we would see that same kind of movement by the Holy Spirit and God. Because like Jesus said in the book of Matthew, the powers of hell will not stand against it. You see, in this time when we are so connected at our fingertips and yet we're so lonely and we have things like suicide rates really skyrocketing and anxiety and things, the church is meant to be that peace. It is meant to usher in grace and life and light and It is meant to be the clear picture of God. And believe it or not, it literally pushes back the gates of hell from people's lives. Because as we gather together and we worship and we lift up the name of Jesus, the gates of hell are pushed back. When we extend a hand of prayer over our brother and sister, even online, the gates of hell are pushed back. When we feed our community and meet tangible needs in the name of Jesus, the gates of hell are pushed back. And as we lift up the name of Jesus, crucified, risen, and coming again, the gates of hell are pushed back. Why else do you think everything else goes against it? Why else do you think Satan has lied and told the world that church is inconsequential and that you don't need it? Look what we get to be a part of, you guys. We get to be a part of that. And the gates of hell cannot stand against it. But I will say though, if you're here tonight or you're watching online and you're kind of thinking to yourself, I've been coming for a while. I go to the crossroads. I I watch online at crossroads, but I don't get any of that stuff. None of that is happening for me. Then I'm gonna throw out a challenge to you. How are you being the hands and feet of Jesus? How are you stepping out? How are you getting involved? There's even ways online that you can get involved. What are you doing to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Are you striving for connection or are you just leaving in the middle of invitation? So tonight, 
I'm actually gonna pray for two different groups of people. I'm gonna pray for that first group of people, that first group that I just talked about. Those of you who feel like you are here, but you're not really here, but you want to be here. You want to experience what Tani experienced. You want to experience what Ernie experienced. You want more. I'm gonna give you a chance to come forward and join us in the living room too, to tell us that you are ready for more. And then I'm also gonna pray for those of you who might be here tonight or watching with us online and you feel totally lost because you're like, I want that, but I don't even know how to get that. It starts with a relationship with Jesus first. You have to know Jesus. You have to believe that he came on this earth for you to die for you and then rose again from the grave for you. You have to believe that and accept that first and then he will usher you into the body, which is the church. So will you join me in prayer right now as we lift up these two groups of people? Jesus, thank you for your church. Thank you that it is strong and though it is filled with imperfect people, that it is your perfect plan. Lord, I wanna lift up that first group of people right now that feel like they're missing. They're missing out. They're here, but they're not really here. They're not connected and they want what was talked about tonight. I pray that you would move in their spirit, oh Lord, and that you would give them the courage, the desire to come forward and to tell us that they want more. And now, Lord, I also lift up to you those that feel completely lost. They don't know where they stand with you at all. They don't even know if you care for them. God, I pray that their heart would be opened to know you tonight. And now I'm gonna give those people an opportunity to pray right now in your heart if you would like to make a decision to follow the Lord, to be grafted into his family through Jesus Christ, I want you to pray with me right now. You can pray this in your heart or even out loud. You can say, dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for choosing me. I have so many things I've done, so many things that make me feel far from you, but I need you in my life and I want more. So I say yes to you tonight and I ask for you to come into my life and lead me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer or even that first prayer, if you have a desire to know God more, I want to invite you as we sing in worship this next song together. I want you to come forward. I know it seems like a lot, but come forward and head into what we call the living room over there where we would have pastors that are ready to meet with you and pray with you. So as we all stand together right now, we're gonna stand um, and we're gonna worship the Lord. And if you want more with your relationship or you want a relationship, come join us in the living room there. from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not be and shall not fade by His blood and by
incredible. My goodness, she is one of my favorite pastors, one of my favorite preachers. Let's let her know how incredibly blessed we were by the message from tonight. But in lieu, in lieu of what she just taught on, I want us to hang on to this phrase that we all have a role to play. That means if you're a Christ follower in here, we're called to encourage, we're called to pray. So we're going to do that right now. Uh, there was a lot of prayer requests that were sent in right before service. And as a body, we're gonna pray for them. But I wanna give you some homework, if you will. I want you to pull out your phones and I want you to take a photo of all the names, all the prayer requests, because we're gonna pray for them all week. Why? Because we all have a role to play, amen? But together right now, um, you'll see the names come up on the screen. Douglas, he is uh, seeking apparently for guidance for his future. I wanna pray for him and Emery and Lorraine who are praying for the health. Let's pray for them now and then we'll move on down the list. Lord, we know God that you direct our steps. Uh, I pray Lord for Douglas, whether he's watching online or here in person, that he would know you see him. I pray God that uh, that you would allow him to be guided by you. Uh, whatever it is that he's praying for in his future, I pray that he enjoys the journey, but that he gets to see you and hear you guiding him throughout the way. Uh, Lord, we pray for Emery and Lorraine. Uh, God, you are our healer. We ask God that you'd bring healing to both of them, whatever their needs might be. Uh, we come together as a church knowing, God, that nothing is impossible with you. So we pray, God, for healing on them. Uh, for Armida, Lord, uh, you... Uh, everything comes from you, God. We pray for the job, uh, Lord, uh, whether that's a conflict at work or if they're seeking a job, I pray that you would open doors uh, for them to be able to find work. I pray for Brandy, Lord, that you would bless uh, the, her efforts in an exam if that's at school. Um, I pray, God, that you would uh, allow her to really just have confidence in you. Uh, if it's a medical exam, God, we pray that you would give her favor and that you'd be with the doctors in that uh, we pray for Monique's health, God, again, that you would bring healing, um, whatever it is that she might be working through, God, you know all things. We pray for healing on her. Uh, God, I pray for wisdom over Adam um, with his kids, that you'd be with him and um, uh, give him guidance in that as he uh, fathers his children, God. Uh, I pray for Cynthia specifically. Lord, we come together asking God that you would grant her your peace. You say that you keep in perfect peace those whose minds are fixed on you. And I pray, God, that in the midst of her panic attacks, in the midst of her anxiety, that she's able to truly lift up her posture towards you and that she would experience the peace that you've promised. Uh, God, we pray for Brittany's uh, business and her mom's health. God, that you would be with her mom's health and uh, give her favor in her business. For Gracie's health as well, God, uh, bring healing, bring restoration. Uh, God, I pray that um, Renee would be confident first and foremost in who she is in you, that that would bleed into every, uh, every area of her life, God, that she would be confident as your child uh, or he. Um, I pray, God, that you would just bless them with that. Again, Veronica, Lord, I pray again that you would bless her with your peace. Uh, God, um, I pray for Cameron, that you would ease the pain in his arm and that you would be with them and bring healing. Lord, we pray for Colette as she's moving. God, that you would uh, grant her your peace again throughout the whole process and um, just be with her during that. Uh, we pray for Debbie as well for healing and the anonymous person that also needs healing with cancer. God, we, uh, again, uh, I want to pray specifically that you'd bring them your peace. Uh, Lord, uh, what a big word and what a scary word. I just ask God that somehow... Uh, they're able to experience your peace and your confidence, but ultimately your healing hand because we know that nothing is impossible with you, Lord. We pray for Brenda, that you'd heal her, and for Grace, that you would guide her. And God, uh, whatever Chris is going through, I pray, Lord, for your protection over him, your guidance. I pray for your church, God, that you'd bless all of us, that you would allow your voice to be the loudest voice in our life as we move forward. In our week, God, we worship you and we love you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's praise God again. I love that we're a church that prays. I hope that you leave here tonight knowing that your heavenly father, he hears you. 
He knows you by name. May God bless you guys. Have a great night. Everyone, if you made a decision tonight to follow the Lord, you can text the word AMEN to 77247. And there you can tell us a little bit about your story, what's going on, and what made you come to that decision to follow Christ. Uh, not only that, we'll get you connected to the Heart of Crossroads and just get to connect with one of us. Uh, just explore how to grow in your faith while having church online. That's right. And if something resonated with you tonight or you just have a prayer request that wasn't covered tonight and you'd like to get that in, you can go ahead and put it in the comments. Um, and we read every comment that comes through. Yeah. We love engaging with you guys. So we'd love to pray for you and also just hear what stuck out to you. Yeah. So one last thing. If you want to have a coffee chat or a time for prayer, just text the word coffee chat to 77247. Also in the live chat, you'll see a couple links. I would encourage you to click on some of those to uh, just learn more about what Crotch is about and get connected so you guys can uh, be prayed for throughout the week. But that's it, guys. We love you so much. We'll and, see you uh, Sunday. We'll see you on Sunday.